handled the first five minutes for me. <laughs> Thank you, Fabio. And as Fabio said, this is very much... Um, I've been the designated talker for um, this afternoon, but uh, it's very much the work of Fabio and Darren Gunsberg and, as, as Fabio said, Pam, who's also not here at the moment, um, helped us in the field work. Um, this is a project put together um, totally and deeply and appreciatively funded by the Sapphire Centre, which is based in Trinity St David, in case you hadn't got the general idea of Trinity St David and our activities in this area. Also um, supported by CADU, with much appreciation. The general aim of our project was to simply consider the way the monastic um, landscapes, or rather particularly the abbeys in Wales, which are all now, generally all of them are in ruins, um, the relationship they had to the landscape and the sky. And this particular paper, we're just focusing on the Cistercian orders, which there are 11 such abbeys there. And we wanted to approach these rather than a simple, let's take a compass bearing and then put it all together in statistics to see what we get. We wanted to take a far more um, anthropological, archaeological, uh, art history, medieval um, approach. And indeed, um, the team that we had is myself, I'm an anthropologist, Darren's an art historian, and you know, Fabio is an archaeologist and astronomer, would I call that? Yes. So we're a mixed group, but we've, that's been very much intentionally um, the team we've pulled together. Here are the sites, the 11 Cistercian abbeys, which are uh, measurable. There's a couple that are missing from that because there's no visible trace above the ground. There's traces below the ground, but we weren't going out with a pick and shovel. We were going out with a compass <coughs> and clinometers. We measured all the sites with handheld um, compasses, taking, of course, magnetic readings um, and also elevations. Obviously, we translated the, um, met the magnetic uh, readings to True Compass, True North. And I'm not going to digress here talking about our levels of uncertainty, which we took a great deal of care with and incorporated into our results. <laughs> and also when the horizon view was obscured, then we used um, Hey What's That, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, the true azimuths of the 11 Welsh abbeys, which are still measurable from above the ground, vary from 70 to 106 degrees of true azimuth. So that's a variation of 36 degrees, which is fairly substantial. And they're all sitting in very different sorts of landscapes, like, hey, this is Wales we're talking about. Um, so we haven't, it's not the Netherlands. <laughs> there is a real question here about the landscape's influence on these orientations. And indeed, that's one of the reasons we've asked this question of these abbeys. Um, however, what was interesting, just jumping really to the end, is that when we took the landscape into account, the orientations, although quite diverse, fell into a sense of order or patterns. So just a point to clarify here, that if we had just taken the azimuth, then we'd be looking for what would be known as symbolic or even theological um, sunrise or sunset. This is Valcruces looking towards the western door, and you can see the mountains behind it. And if we just took the azimuth of the abbey, we would be working out the dates of the western sunset, like there. Indeed, that's Pan right there. <laughs> um, and obviously, that is never going to happen at this site. So what we were calculating is when would the actual sun, this is sunset, obviously it's the west, would actually occur, the sunlight shining down through the abbey, which would be, in this case, the top of those hills. Is this a pointer? Do we have a... Yeah, top of those hills there, just there. So we were calculating when the sun was going to hit there, and that's just an example of what we did for all of the abbeys. Um, and so in this particular case... Working with the Julian calendar, we calculated that there was the 20th of April and the 10th of August. That date's not relevant at the moment, just to sort of point out the process. Um, this is the eastern end of Valcruces, and a similar thing. You can see that the photograph is a little bit burnt out, but the hill line is coming through here. So we're never going to get sunrise through these windows at the east. We're going to get it coming through up here. And so these dates are shifted like so. Okay, so just quickly looking at just not all of the abbeys, just a collection of the abbeys to give you an idea of the feel for these Cistercian abbeys, which by the whole nature of their theology were located 
out of the general humdrum of medieval life, in isolation, in places where people were not necessarily wanting to go that often, or if people were there to start with, people were moved out of the way. Strata Florida, um, I'm just going to show, I'm going to use this sort of schema for all of them. Here's the abbey just here, it's a plan of it. Um, contour map scale, 200 metres, they're all the same scale. You can see from the contour lines that it's sitting on the floor of a valley and its sort of east end is butting up against this um, hill here. And indeed, this is a hey, what's that? You can see the east, you can see the horizon. Now, they are, um, you probably can't read the figures, but they are, the horizons are exaggerated um, in hey, what's that from time to time. But just a point to note that this abbey is azimuth is 80, is true azimuth is, is 80 degrees, the eastern end, so just, just to hold a figure in your head. Um, and if we just continue on, this is Valcrucis, which this is a picture of the abbey here, you can see the hills around it, um, you can see from the contour map, it's very tightly wedged in between um, two, it's sort of a hill here and a hill there, and the valley runs like this, and here we've got an azimuth here, true is of 97. And then if we look at Neath, which is down in the south, it's on a, a river plain. Um, indeed, it's fairly flat and open towards the front. We look here, we can see it's fairly flat and open, and as a of 80 degrees and hills at the back of it. And then also at the Conway, now sorry, I just shot you back up to the north again. Um, and it's also on a, on a river plain facing out onto this um, watery area here, onto the river Conway. And um, you can see the, to the east it's fairly flat and that's got an azimuth of uh, 70 degrees and to the west you've got these hills in the background. And then Tintin Abbey, which is probably the iconic Cistercian Abbey of Wales, um, nestled up against um, into the, to the river on a very narrow valley um, wedged between hills really and you can see these hills here. And its azimuth to the east is 106 degrees, so quite, that was our most extreme away from 90 degrees. And finally, come here, up in, in Middish, <coughs> north of Middish Wales, rammed into this valley, um, orientated to back and front along the valley with very steep hills either side, and its azimuth was 79. So you've got this really different sort of azimuth connection, and clearly you've got very different landscapes. Now, once we take the azimuth and the altitude measurements, of course, the ease of that is we can actually translate that into declinations. Um, and this is Valcrucis again, this is uh, Stellarium, so it pops up all the time now and it's wonderful. I've just put the declination grid on here, this is 10, this is 20, and this is just showing the sun setting through the western doors here at 13.8 declination. One thing I would love to have in Stellarium is being able to use a defined declination line. Okay. Count? Yep. Oh, right, okay. More conversation is. Oh, good. I'm going home now to play some more. All right, thank you. Um, okay, I've got to sort that one out. Thank you. Okay, so forever smartly moving on. Um, one of the standard conventions that uh, happens within archaeoastronomy is declinations are collected like this, or azimuths are collected like this, and histograms are actually built. Um, and indeed, these are the histograms east and west of our declinations, east deck, west deck. And they look interesting and go, ooh, ah, they're meaningless. They're meaningless because you've actually just taken all these unique individuals, these abbeys, and tried to pretend that they're one thing. And they're not. It's like taking your average age and finding that in the room. What does it tell us about the people in this room? Not really very much at all. I mean, it might on some level, but not really a great deal. So we rejected this, but the reason we put it up here is because this has been the default position to do when studying the orientations of abbeys or churches. In the end, what we did, alternatively, a more anthropological approach, and I like to think this is one of the things that I've really brought to the project, but but Fabio as well, and Darren as an art history historian looking at things individually. This is simply looking at the abbeys and allowing each one to be an individual. And so, just these are, oh, this, everything is Julian here, Julian calendar, but we've got a calendar at the top here, and 
probably hard to see because the lights are on, but you've got the grey line sunrise, the red line sunset. So, for example, Tinton Abbey here, sun rising here late February, early March, into mid-March, sunset through the west here in midish to late April, uh, sunset again in uh, early <coughs> August, and sunrise here in September. That's basically what the diagram is telling you. Now, if I had an hour to speak to you, we could go through each one and really come to grips with it, but um, I don't have an hour, so I'm just going to sort of cut to the chase a little bit. In stacking them up like this, just in against each other, you can start to see where there is some level of commonality. So in a sense, we've removed the landscape, but we've taken the landscape into account to work out these dates. So in a sense, we've, we've been able to look at them as a common group, embracing their individuality. And in doing that, um, in looking at the major <coughs> feast of the Virgin, which of course has a every Cistercian Abbey is dedicated to the Virgin Mary, so there's a strong theological theme to have that connection to the Virgin. This is the blue dates here. There is the theological equinox or the Annunciation here at the 25th of March. A sort of a slight <coughs> twitch on it, but not really a strong alignment. There's also um, the Feast of the Assumption here in the 15th of August, and we actually suspect that this could have been quite strong, but it's not. Um, and also the Nativity of the Virgin, 8th of September here, a slight sort of contact there. Um, a mirror imaging of the Annunciation, which in itself is an interesting discovery, that the Annunciation sunrise has actually a link to the Nativity of the Virgin, sunset the other side. So there's a... There's actually... I only discovered that this morning. <laughs> you know, when you keep doing something, you start noticing things. Um, but what was interesting is, uh, and this is a yellow line here that came up on the 14th of March, kept pounding out, and I can remember pulling the figures together thinking, why the 14th of March? Um, and then I realised, doing this is the Julian calendar, and the 14th of March is astronomical equinox, the actual equinox. So although then their calendar might have been telling them the equinox is the 25th of March, it actually physically, if you're measuring the horizon, is actually in the 12th and 13th century, the 14th of March. And the other thing that kept coming up quite by surprise um, were these two green lines, and they're at the end of September or very early March, and they sort of reflect each other, sunrise, sunset, and sunset. And this is actually for Michaelmas, which is also St David's Day which is St David's, the patron saint of Wales, but also picking up in the west, always in the west, to Michaelmas. And just as an aside, we, we have been finding that when we've, we've been doing virtual work in English Cistercian abbeys, and we've done real work, field work, in Irish Cistercian abbeys, and we're finding this Michaelmas ticking up along the way. Now, the dilemma of East, if people say, right, churches faced East, etc., just, just looking at it, um, Isadora of Seville um, spoke that a church should face east so that the congregation, when they look towards the altar, they're looking to the east, but they're looking towards the part of the sky which split the sky in two in equal proportions. Um, Duridanus spoke, he commented on it 600 years later, actually 700 years later, he sort of wrote, the foundation must be so contrived as that the head of the church may point due east, that is, to the point of the heavens where the sun arises at the equinox to signify that the church militant must behave herself with moderation, both in prosperity and in adversity, and not towards that point where the sun arises at the solstice, which is the practice of some. There's much to be made from that quote. Now, as many of you will be aware, the equinox occurs when the sun is on the equator in both March and September, the equinoxes. On these days, um, there is a balance of day and night. There's little wobbles on that, but we can say that generally. And also, on a totally flat horizon, of course, the sun will rise and set due east and due west. It's all very nice, but in Wales, we don't have the flat horizon. So, but what we're actually finding 
Um, all right, I just sorry, an additional point that should be made is that on those days, the sun actually, on any local horizon, is at the midpoint of its, of its span. If you take solst winter solstice, summer solstice, mark that on the horizon, the midpoint will be the equinox, no matter what that horizon basically is. So it's that balance, it's balance of the hours of the day and balance of the halves of the sky and the halves of the skyscape, in a sense, that Isadora is talking about when he says the right and left parts of the sky are equal. And indeed, we have found that this is what is really going on with many of the Cistercian abbeys in Wales. This is a collection, here's five. Five of the 11 abbeys really capture this, and probably a bit small to see here, um, but just this one here, which is Basingwork Abbey, um, has a declination of 91 flat horizon, so clearly it's going to pick up to a due east sunrise. Um, the red bar indicates it's happening at sunset, happening in the west, and this is um, Kim Heer Abbey, that was the one deep in the mountains, and that has an azimuth of 70 degrees, but in the west it's picking up to astronomical sunset. Then here, uh, Kum here, Abbey, right at the end here, has, I've got to put my glasses on as well, <laughs> um, an azimuth of 84 degrees, <coughs> and that's picking up in the west to astronomical sunset. Then down here, we've got another one, Margram Abbey on a flat surface, pointing to 91 degrees, and it's picking up um, to the astronomical sunset as well. This hill means it doesn't get the astronomical sunrise. And then Tinton Abbey, with our 106 degrees rammed amongst the hills, has swung itself. Indeed, after about 70 years, they shifted the foundations by one degree. Think of the workload, people, right? They shifted the whole church by one degree um, to get it a little bit tighter, uh, 106 degrees. And sunrise over that hill in front of the eastern windows happens at astronomical sun. Um, Equinox. So what we're seeing here is um, a sense of the. Uh, how come we're not going forward? There we are. The other three abbeys that we've um, others just to quickly point this out. The three that pick up to Michaelmas, um, Trinity, uh, Strata Florida, sorry, 80 degrees. Then by a nice coincidence, Neath, which is on a flat plane, 80 degrees, and they all have 80 degrees. The only nunnery, the Cistercian nunnery here, also has 80 degrees. And all of these, this is Strata Florida here, get a beautiful <coughs> sunset coming straight through here on Michaelmas, which is the 29th of September, or some argue St David's Day, which would be fine if it only happened in the Welsh abbeys, but it's not, it's happening beyond that. So what does all of that mean? Um, clearly what's important for the Welsh Cistercian abbeys anyway, and indeed other abbeys we're looking at, is that the, the declination needs to be taken into account, not the azimuth. The sense of the landscape must be incorporated. They're looking at actual sunrise and sunsets. Um, and to analyse them using a case study methodology, an anthropological approach rather than a, using histograms. Um, and um, the, the landscape really gives us an understanding of the, of the, the makes sense of the orientations of these <coughs> abbeys. And just to sort of finalise, sometimes we work away and we work in our own little bubbles um, and we find something interesting and we share it with our, our community and we all go, that's great, and we even publish within our own journals and that's wonderful. But what makes it, I think, more important for archaeoastronomy is to actually be an instrument or tool for other disciplines and indeed, what we've done with this is we've been accepted for publication in a French Cistercian journal, which is one of the um, main journals in the world on Cistercian studies, so we're quite chuffed, to be honest. But what's exciting is <coughs> for them, their debate, their big debate, is chicken and egg. What comes first, the cloisters or the abbey, or is laid out? And it's been generally debated and it's almost settled on until our paper landed on the desk that the cloisters were laid out and the cloisters were built and the cloisters were doing first and the dormitories, logical, but this was laid out and there was a tack on the abbey would be 90 degrees to that. But what our paper suggests because the orientation of the abbey is so important in picking up, is suggesting 
that the Abbey not necessarily built first, but laid out first. And then from that layout, the cloisters and the rest of the situation comes extended from that. So this, from Cistercian studies, is actually a revolution in the archaeology for them. And it's uh, helping them with that argument simply by incorporating the sky into their, adding that as another primary source piece of material for their archaeological work. So, yeah, done. <laughs>